Let's travel with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo over here at reallibertymedia.com. RLM Radio. And I've listed the keystrokes in the background as the. No, as you're the, not. No, as, you're not. As the intro was playing. But, you know, that, that happens. How's everyone doing out there? Everyone doing well? Let's see. On this Sunday evening, the 3rd of June. 3rd of June. And before I forget, I want to point out. That before we broadcast again, another anniversary of the attack on the USS Liberty is coming up. And that would be on the 8th of June. 8th of June. So just keep that in mind. And if you ever wondered about who's the who's who, who's your friend and who isn't, well, just look back at the circumstances surrounding the USS Liberty. And if, you have ne- if you've never heard of it, you probably want to do a little research. And there's a Liberty Survivors Group. Whoever the folks that are left, this was something that occurred back in, I think, 1967 and has yet to have been re- actually resolved. Anyway, enough on that. So, Gigi's Boo, how are you doing this week? Doing okay. Can't complain. Yeah? And Could, but let's don't, let's don't do that. You don't complain, you just keep trotting on. Yeah, that's right. And complaining doesn't fix a thing, really. It just uh, it's like people when they get angry and emotional. The only person you're hurting is you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you're, not, you're not hurting. I don't have time for that. Mm-mm. Ain't nobody got time for that. I've known That's you. right. Had I known you going to say that, I'd set that clip up. But yeah. I, I don't Ain't have, nobody got time for that. I don't have. I don't have sweet Brown. Yeah. I don't know if they've ever heard of Sweet Brown. She was uh, down around Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken, and, and her apartment caught fire and newspeople interviewed her mm-hmm. and boy she gave them a roundabout and she looked up when she got through and she said ain't nobody got time for that that's right and it just went all over the country everybody's picked that up and mm-hmm. playing that clip she's mm-hmm. she's been on national tv and everything she's pretty cool <laughs> gal it's amazing what can what can turn into uh, a fame a fame stricken life with just one little outburst like that yeah, so how's everyone out there in RLM land? Real Liberty Media for you guys, you guys. I'm going to use some Pennsylvania slang for you. So you guys out there who don't know where Real Liberty Media is, it's reallibertymedia.com. And also a chat room, interactive chat room. And you can enter that by going to reallibertymedia.com. And halfway down the page on the front, you'll see a little chat app that you can put your name in like John Doe or Agent Smith or whatever and uh, enter the chat room and say hello to all these fine people who are residents here and they seem like they're like full time residents I have to ask Grimner if this is a section 8 chat room <laughs> what do you think Gigi? oh my god you didn't say that did you? <laughs> well people are all, always here yeah, and you can live here. Oh, there's nothing wrong with being always here. Yeah, but you can live here rent free. How do you do that? And so, so you have to a, give a donation. So, yeah. Oh yeah, donations. Yeah. Well, how does that work? We well, can go to the Real Liberty Media, reallibertymedia dot com, and there's lots of different ways that, that you can help Grimnir out. And Grimnir is the chief cook and bottle washer over here. Lots of ways you can help him out. He takes all kinds of virtual money he takes the old standby paypal and takes doge coins and also one of the little known things that is you can actually if you're one who still uses amazon you can make your amazon purchases via the gateway that grim era set up and he's that makes him an affiliate for amazon he gets a little bit of little bit of input from monetary input from from Amazon if you make your purchases through there. Now, bear in mind, it doesn't cost you any more. You're going to pay the same, but in this case, we'll help out the website that's been here for ever, just like these chatters. <laughs> Gr- Graham near wanted to know what is Section 8. 
Oh, you know that that's where you can live somewhere without without having to pay anything. Well, not not necessarily not have to pay anything. It's based on your income, and the government makes up the difference. You have to pay just a little bit. And sometimes people don't pay anything, but most of the time they have to pay something if it isn't but just a dollar. Now, let me stress, there's been a lot of people that have wanted to rent houses and get them on Section 8. And the government does have rules and regulations. That has Mm -hmm. to meet their guidelines. So Mm -hmm. it's not just real easy to have a Section 8 house or whatever. Well, you see, that that makes the chat room even more special because... There are no requirements. You can come in here and live, and you can theoretically live for free, but that's not really so good. You can, pay, you can, you can throw up like 5 or $10 in the direction of reallibertymedia.com, and, and the rest of it is subsidized, just like Section 8. So, so what's the big difference here? Well, I think the big difference is you can not only come in here and share what you think without too much, too much. I heard a dog bark. <laughs> oh no! Here we go. Atticus. 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 <laughs> Atticus. Is now here goes Smelly. Now we're going to have a duet, dog duet here. So stand. I'm on mute, so it won't be. Stand by. <laughs> anyway, it looks like uh, Atticus and Melly decided to join the show. Anyway, didn't mean to get too off the track on that Section 8 thing. It's actually kind of supposed to have been a joke, but it got a little out of hand, it looks like. It's a funny, you know, in our politically correct world, how specific terms can trigger a lot of people. <laughs> I, I don't know. I was teasing him and told him I was in the chat room, and I shouldn't have done it. I said, Hal's in there. Graham's in there, all your buddies in there that like to hear about your escapades. And he just started yel- yelping, so I said, oh, God. Yeah, that's me. You got what you asked for. <laughs> anyway, that kind of goes back to something we talked about previously, about those apartment complexes, the rental properties in New Jersey, RPM management, I think it was. Where they tell you you can't have any weapons, you can't have any arms. Your your right to bear arms is is violated there. And I, based on what I can see from their website, they probably fall into that Section Eight category, as Roberts points out, based on sliding scale. And so that's correct. Yeah, and it looks like that that the term Section Eight tipped off quite a conversation in the chat room. <laughs> so. That's like I say, you never know what's going to come out. Sometimes you just anyway. Let's get back on track here. CDs do. I mean, you know, help out reallibertymedia.com. dot com. They've been here for a long time. Sweat Equity by Grimnir, who just keeps this place going week after week after week, and they have lots of shows. You know, look at the front page. Pick your poison. Have lots of shows, lots of fun stuff. And anyway, that's the name of that tune. CDs do. What else going on? Not much. We're just fiddle diddling around here and doing what I always do. Okay, I see. We're we're stretching and our content's a little bit thin if you haven't figured that out already. <laughs> so kind of stretching a little bit here tonight. So let's just move forward. And since we got people's attention on politically correct things, let's talk about this high school that was put on Craigslist for sale. Wow. Truman High School in Kansas City. An ad says, huge 20-plus room facility, newly built football field, baseball field to the southeast, newly added four modern day rooms, has central heat, central air, plumbing, it's next to Walmart for your convenience, and there's a huge parking lot. Yeah, Truman High School was put onto Craigslist, and it looks like somewhere in the neighborhood of May 18th or so, and the student did it as a senior prank but senior prank triggered some people because of the way he worded it by saying at the end trying to find it okay here we go he said he decided to say the reason that they were selling it was because of the loss of students the upcoming loss of students now anybody with half a brain would surmise 
what would they surmise from a, a senior putting that into an ad? What what's the logic logical assumption from that TV's be? That this I think it's just a big prank. Yeah, uh, I mean a hazing I, type thing. No, I mean from his statement that they're selling it because of the loss of students. What well, they're leaving. The seniors are leaving. Well, exactly, yeah, exactly. But no, the the school and the and I guess the school board, the school administrators said that that was an implied threat. Oh, please! And they punished the senior for having placed that ad as a joke. And it's like Gigi's boot just proved. The logical inference is that they're talking about the departing senior class. But no, we have in this era of school shootings and student on student on student crime, we have to infer from that that it's a threat. It said that the police department in Independence, Missouri, investigated the ad and decided not to pursue criminal charges, but told Shield to remove the post and suggested he speak with school administrators. However, that didn't help much. The local news outlet was told that the administration suspended him for the remainder of the school year and is not allowing him to walk in the graduation. That is so stupid. Mm -hmm. The school saw the post as an implied threat, although not a credible one. Now, from my understanding of things, you can't prosecute someone for a threat if the threat is not viable. In other words... I could threaten you, then I'm going to look at you and make your toenails fall off. Is that a viable threat? Well, of course not. <laughs> Their statement here is, Out of an abundance of caution, administrators and police investigated and determined there was not a credible threat. A student who makes a real or implied threat, whether it is deemed credible or not, will face discipline. How chilling to your First Amendment. And they've added extra police officers for the remainder of the year and will have additional officers at the graduations for all of their high schools. So, getting back to the whole concept of a very innocuous phrase triggering people, this is the kind of world that we're conditioned to live in. We've been conditioned to be this way. Be careful what you say. Be careful of the adjectives that you use, the examples that you cite. Because someone's going to be threatened, or someone's going to be offended, and the wrath of Khan will descend upon you. <laughs> Grim Ryan might be a wizard. That's right. You never know. All things are possible. I mean, I can decide that I'm a dog. I want to identify as a dog. Does that mean that I have to be compelled to have a rabies shot? You would have to bark like and howl like Atticus. Yes, that, we, uh, Melly and Atticus and I could run around the yard on, on all fours, and the dog catcher would have to come out and have to be licensed. I identify as a dog. You see how ridiculous it is? Uh, uh, people are actually seriously engaged in this kind of mind mess. Unbelievable. Anyway, Gigi's boo, well, you better be careful about what you say. And notice the, the grammatically incorrect headline says so punished for implied threat. No, it's an inferred threat. There was a difference. We had a pretty interesting talk yesterday on the Suspect, suspect Sky channel. I have trouble saying a lot of things tonight, or any time for that matter. And we talked about a lot about the 5G business. And we also talked about the Deagle the Deagle report that doesn't seem to want to go away, but it seems like uh, other people are starting to pick up on this whole idea. I mean, you know, we're talking with Within a seven-year window, dropping about 60 to 70 percent of the U.S. population. And lots of um, interesting thoughts about what that could be all related to. But with that in mind, did you know that there are consultants out there that charge about $1,000 a day? to help you learn how to live off the grid in the event of society's collapse. Sounds like a pretty good gig, Gigi Boo. Where do you sign up? Uh -huh. Where do you sign up? I don't know, but we could teach that. No, no. Survival expert Jonathan Hollerman believes that America, as we know it, could be 
destroyed from the loss of the nation's electric grid or other societal collapse. Now, that's actually one of the things that could account for such a drastic and immediate decrease in population. Could certainly do that. And uh, I can't think of many other things that might do that. Hollerman says preparedness experts underestimate the threat posed by starving and desperate people. That is certainly a concern. Without the power grid, there would be no lights, no heating or air conditioning, no public water, and the sewer would likely back up. Yes, it would. And, of course, you can't pump any gas out of the gas pumps, can you? So without modern vehicles or interstate trucking, the supermarkets would run out of food and supplies very quickly. I think we've estimated that they'd last about two hours. Is that what we've talked about, Judy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this article from the Daily Mail is an interesting read. It's from the 2nd of June, so it's fairly up to date. And this fellow I was just mentioning is a preparedness expert and former military survival instructor. So he's probably somebody to be worth listening to. And he buys his clients over the phone $450 an hour. Wow, gee, we're in the wrong line of work about the best way to prepare their home for disaster. He also performs operational security analysis for existing survival retreats for $1,000 a day. All righty. Well, I have to tell you, though, from my experience and knowledge that there are some very very specialized people out there who train very hard and just along these lines as far as sierra hotel india tango event they train real hard and they're very very experts very expert especially tactical things and i can see where you know a thousand dollars a day would be probably a deal if that's the way you want to go. We'll include this article for the, those of you who would like to read it. It's it's interesting. It's it's the down and dirty, really. I mean, this is it doesn't get any dirtier than this. And But realistically, that's what one might be facing in, in such a scenario. Any thoughts on any of that, Judy? I'm being quiet. Go ahead. All righty. How about in a related article? What do you do for your young ones? How do you prepare them for a potential event such as we just discussed? An article in Simple Family Preparedness, it's a website, simplefamilypreparedness.com, asks a question, you might know what needs to be done, but what about the young ones? Do they know what to do? In the event of an emergency, uh, we as adults have checklists in our heads about what we probably need to do. And, of course, you know, the young ones are on the list, you know, obviously concerned how to make them safe. But what if such an emergency occurs and, like, they're at school and you're at home? And we all know how schools are today (laughs) about letting your young ones go home with you. In some places, they don't even allow you to walk. I can't even imagine what the knee-jerk reaction would be to such an event as that and what you would do so they point out what ages that that young ones should start learning about emergency preparedness start them real young start them real young yeah it says science has discovered that languages understanding and memory are best developed before the age of five however comprehension and formulating ideas are best developed between three and eight years of age there's kind of your target range you want to think about and so when is the best time to, to share information about emergency preparedness? And the writer of this article says the sooner the better. You can begin as soon as the young one is able to start doing for themselves. If they're walking, talking, and learning about environment, that's when you can start. We've got bug out bags that we started at ours with, and they check them every so often. Mm-hmm. Our nieces, and their but since they were little, they can tell you what everything in there is for. Mm-hmm. And we, we go over it every once in a while. They have a bottle of water in there, enough bottled water to last, well, it probably could last three or four days if they rationed it. But they also have the life straw. They have an emergency blanket, first aid kit, change of clothes, food for three days. And they're taught to put it on and take it off in a hurry. Mm-hmm. And they even have a little box. I got a little soap dish that you can pick up at the dollar stores. We put Vaseline on cotton balls and put down in there. 
gave them matches and lighters, and they know they're only supposed to use this to start a fire in case of an emergency. We got tarps that we can set up. So, yeah, we've taught them from a very, very young age. Yeah, and one of the things that might be added to this, now, obviously, there's some, some of those things you can't take to school. You, know, you could not go take any fire starting materials to school, or you'll wind up like that student who put the high school up for sale. <laughs> But, yeah, true. But anyway, what you can do, and probably something that isn't thought about too often, is making a map for a evacuation route. Mm-hmm. So in a power-down, communications-down scenario, that map should be probably in the backpack all the time. So all they have to do is pull it out and look at it and make it clear enough so major landmarks, major roads, things that are easily recognizable. Let me say one other thing here, and I won't interrupt you more. Um, There's also a need to teach your children and grandchildren, your younger children, what to do if an active shooter comes in. You'd be surprised at the people who will tell them, if you hear gunfire, run. Not if you're in an enclosed area. The best thing to do is lay down, ball up under something, and be extremely quiet. And so we have told them if we're in church, don't run. Get under the pew, cover your head. Of course, if any of us adults are near them, we're going to cover them with us. We're going to go first. But you need to tell your children about that. Tell them about a school shooting. Make them aware in their schoolroom to look around and see if there's a closet or to pull the desk down over on them. They're not going to, might not teach them this in school, but if you make them aware of what they should be doing, it's going to go automatically. It's going, they're going to kick in and they're going to do it. And I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah. And one of the things, physiologically, running, your eye is geared to pick up motion. Yeah. And they're so, going to be shot first. Yeah. So if, there's a, a tunnel vision type of effect occurs under those circumstances for and it, for most people who aren't heavily trained in, in the shooting assault skills, they will automatically go into this tunnel vision mode. However, your peripheral vision is geared to pick up movement. So, yeah, if you're moving quickly, it will be, get picked up on the radar very fast. The, the human perceptions are designed that way. So being very quiet still, if you have to move at all, do it very slowly and deliberately. That you're less likely to get picked up that way. So anyway, on that note, thanks for sharing that. Along with this evacuation plan, the evacuation route, the evacuation map, perhaps one could put site 1, 2, and 3, places that are well known to the young ones. And this is where they should go where we'll meet up. This is our meetup point. If we're not at number one within a, a little while, then move on to number two. Okay, it's not perfect, and there's certain drawbacks. It's something that needs to be rehearsed, obviously, and it's not hard to do. I mean, it can be done on a weekend when schools are not in session. You see, and this can be rehearsed out of the view of prying, triggerable people who say, "Oh my God, the child is walking by him or herself." <laughs> Oh, God, what a world we're in. It's I know. Just, this is incredible, especially as I get, being a little bit older than many now, I can look back to the days where, God, we would, had we fast forwarded instantly to the conditions that we are in today, we, we would have been absolutely astounded. It would have been, actually been funny. I can remember. We we would have thought all the way, the way people act and think now would have been hilarious. That you people are ridiculous. You're absolutely ridiculous. I don't know. It is what it is, I suppose. What about the 5G? We talked a lot about that yesterday. And this, it goes on. I mean, this continues to be a big issue. And let's just get to the, I guess, the bottom line first. Why is this such a major issue? And this came up in yesterday's podcast that it's so important because it's so much easier to address something before it's in place than it is to try to undo it after it's in place. And unfortunately, like in cases of vaccine damage and all these sorts of things, that dog has already busted loose. 
and trying to retroactively address it all is probably next to impossible. We'll say highly unlikely. And it's always even gone to the point this came up also. What about the liabilities involved? Since no insurance company will touch this. So who's liable? Well, guess what? What happened with the vaccine industry when liability became an issue? Congress stepped in and said, oh, you're forgiven. You cannot be held liable because we're the taxpayers are going to take care of the liabilities through the vaccine courts. Isn't it highly likely that as this evolves, the same sort of approach will be taken with the microwave, I guess you'd say, the EMF, the EMF damages? I think so. I think it's highly likely. And, of course, there's your get-out-of-jail-free card. The stockholders of all these companies will continue to profit and benefit from damaging people while the the damaged people will have to pay for the damage to themselves. So that's why it's important to try to get on the on the front end of this of this train. It's not going to be an easy fight either, and we'll talk about why in a minute. But the evidence continues to stack up. And this actually <laughs> it's this is kind of a connect the dots sort of exercise. But back in two thousand eleven, hmm, December seventh of all things, interesting kinda of, interesting the date there. The Brain, Gut, Microbe, Communication, and Health and Disease. This is a study, Frontiers in Physiology, Gastrointestinal Sciences. Now, right away from that title, you kind of have a clue what's coming. Bidirectional signaling between the gastrointestinal tract and the brain is regulated at neural, hormonal, and immunological levels. This construct is known as the brain-gut axis and is vital for maintaining homeostasis. Can you translate all that, Gigi's book? Homeostasis is the perfect part of the body. That's the perfect symptom that the body should be in all the time. Perfect. Perfect temperature, blood pressure, no disease, anything. Homeostasis. Mm -hmm. That's about as far as we can go on that because you're not going to ever find that to be perfect. Right. So there's a little catch to that. Oh, okay. And one of the major catches would be if something were interfering with the bidirectional signaling between the gastrointestinal tract and the brain. Exactly. Hmm. And they talk about how bacterial colonization of the intestine plays a major role and so forth in the immune and endocrine systems. The processes are key factors underpinning central nervous system signaling. Now, as they dance around all this, it's pretty clear that the signaling takes the form of electronic signals, right, Gigi's boo? Exactly. Okay. And in a more recent study from Helix Life to underpin all this, a new study connects electromagnetic fields to digestion. Now, remember, we're connecting the dots. And remember the term homeostasis. This is all important. Another amazing and surprisingly little-known fact, and I, I would take extreme exception with that assertion, microbes in our gut primarily communicate via electromagnetic waves. Research published in 2009 by Luc Montag Montagnier, I probably butchered that, who discovered the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, makes me wonder who he really is, reveals that the microbes use natural electromagnetic waves to communicate with each other and with our immune systems. Okay, without going any further with that, can we now start to see what might affect this, which in turn affects your health or homeostasis? Anything you want to add into that, Gigi's boo? What's going on in the atmosphere, things of that sort, microwave activity. Cell phone, all that. Right, and that's what we're addressing here. In the Daily Mail, May 29th, the rollout of 5G wireless service is a massive health experiment. Public health expert warns as cell companies install 800,000 towers across the United States. Now, before we get too deep into this, we think we've already established that, and through about 500 studies, literally, 500 studies dating back into the 60s that examined the effects of electromagnetic frequencies on human beings, and this is not an unknown quantity. This has been well studied, and for anyone who claims otherwise, 
has either drunk the Kool-Aid or is a liar, one or the other. The latest generation of wireless services, 5G, is being rolled out across select cities in the United States and talks about how they operate in general. Some research has suggested that cell phone radiation may be carcinogenic. Maybe. What do you think? And 500 studies from the 60s might also suggest that. New millimeter waves using 5G have hardly been studied, and, and introducing them constitutes an experiment. That's an interesting statement right there. And we'll, see why, mm-hmm. we'll see why in a minute. It says it does constitute an experiment, and I guess logically it would if you don't understand the, the complete effect of the waveforms that you're producing, the biological effects of those. If you don't understand them, uh, it would be an experiment because true science is one endeavoring to understand something. So if you don't already understand it, then you do an experiment to understand it. So I guess logically, that's a very fair assessment. Today, there are 154,000 cell towers in the United States, according to Wireless Communications Association. By 2026, it's estimated that another 800,000 will be needed to support 5G. Mm. We're going to be living all under those things and getting all that stuff up around us. We're going back to the Deagle Report. They would suggest there won't be many people (laughs) having to deal with that. And I really do take, the more I look at the Deagle Report, the more compelled I am to think that really something to these guys. I mean, this, this guy was tied up with the Rockefeller Foundation. So this is a no-joke operation, especially considering the fact that they've managed to maintain a high degree of anonymity online, unless you really knew where to look. Anyway, micromillimeter waves are weaker than, I'm sorry, millimeter waves are weaker than microwaves. They're predominantly absorbed by the skin, meaning their distribution is quite focused there. And we've talked about that also, how you don't always have to penetrate, like for example, your brain matter, if there is a presence of something like aluminum in your brain, a dielectric, which can act as a capacitor, and as it turns out, you don't need to totally penetrate it, you only need to affect the surface area in order to create a chain reaction within the enclosed area. Science has studied that and has demonstrated that, but anyway, since skin contains capillaries and nerve endings, Millimeter wave bioeffects may be transmitted through molecular mechanisms by the skin or through the nervous system. Now think about that. And that's kind of just what I was just saying. Especially if you add in the presence of any dielectrical materials. He also told Daily Mail that he's concerned that 5G will use high Mm -hmm. band frequencies or millimeter waves that may affect the eyes the testes, the skin, the peripheral nervous system, and the sweat glands. So we're getting really detailed here, and I'll just stop at that right there because it's something you need to read. It is, I think it's a winnable battle. I don't think it's going to be an easy one, obviously. You're up against people <laughs> like Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, all these corporations. This is just some heavy-duty stuff. And the fact that, well, guess who sits on the Federal Communications Commission and people from these industries. So, yeah, it's not it's not an easy battle, but it, I think it's one that can be taken, can, can be made and with a potential positive outcome. And just for your research edification, I found a website called emfresearch.com that has 135 peer-reviewed scientific studies and reports showing significant effects of electromagnetic frequency exposures on male fertility, 135, the time span from 1972 to 2012. Remember last week we talked about the declining fertility rates. Remember that, Gigi's boo? Yep. These things make one go, hmm. And here's another one for your research edification. The world's largest animal study on cell tower radiation confirms the cancer link. Remember we were talking about just previously about yeah. the potential for carcin- carcinogenesis, but look look here, confirmed. World largest animal study on cell tower confirms cancer link. They call on the World Health Organization, International Agency for Research on Cancer, to reevaluate the carcinogen car- carcinogenicity well, uh, <laughs> of cell phone radiation after 
the Ramazzini Institute and U.S. government studies report finding the same unusual cancers. That's important, and we'll see why in a minute. And they have a recording from a press conference from March 22nd, 2018. And this article just goes on to talk about this particular study and the details of it. Very important. And one comment here I find interesting is such findings of effects at very low levels. Remember, 5G is very low level, but very uh, heavily transmitted. Let's say with so many antennas. So, you know, you're, in, you're, in a, you're in a bath, so to speak, of low level radiation. Anyway, such findings of effects at very low levels are not are not unexpected, stated Deborah Davis, Ph.D., MPH, president of EHT, I'm not sure what that is, but pointing to Jacobs University Replication Animal Study published in 2015 that also found very low levels of what they call RFR, radio frequency, I suppose, promoted tumor growth. This study confirms that an ever-growing literature confirms an ever-growing literature and provides a wake-up call to governments to enact protective policy to limit exposure to the public and to the private sector to make safe radiation-free technology available. Mm -hmm. This is all leading up to something, everyone. So this is where, I guess, the old saying, where the rubber meets the road, this is where the rubber is going to meet the road. It's all revelations that these studies provide of the damages the actual damages, not the suspected damages, but the actual damages, right? Mm-mm. Yeah. Okay, anything you want to jump in with there, Gigi's Boo? We got no, to, we got, uh, it's we got, okay. We've got to fill some time up here, so you've got to help me out. I have, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Here and here's where the rubber meets the road. Back in, yeah. go, go ahead. I think people, I was, while you were talking, I was sitting here thinking about what we used to see in a home. I remember when we we really thought we were something because we got cable TV. We had an antenna, and it was one of those old boxes you had to get out and punch the numbers on it and all that, and we thought, oh, this is the greatest thing that ever was because we were getting more channels. Then we heard all this stuff on these science fiction movies about computers. You said one whole wall was covered in computers, and they were doing this, and they were doing that. And this is what it's going to be tomorrow. You're going to have computers tomorrow. And everybody laughed. And then all the doctor's offices started going to computers. And they would call what they go back up. They had to back up every day. And they backed up on a floppy disk. And I don't think the RAM was very much the uh, the, the hard drive or the memory, the one. And we thought, this is the way that it's going to be for doctor's offices now. All the doctor's offices not going to have to pull files. Everything can be done through the computer. They still have filing systems. Then you heard where it's going to be made for home computers. And people had gasp when they thought about homes having computers. Now every home's got a computer. If you don't have a computer in your home, you have a, a cell phone that you can get online with. People have become so electronically inclined that they have forgotten to use their brain. I remember the first cell phone I ever saw in my life. I was a little girl, and I was in a doctor's office, and this drug rep came in and had this great big old bag, and it had a cell phone, honestly, that looked like it might have been 12 inches tall, maybe a little more. And he took that thing out of that bag, and he was using it, and I thought, what is this that this man's using? And I asked my mother, and she said, I think that is what they're calling now a cell phone. Why have we invented all this stuff to use when in the long run it's killing us? We talked about this. It's to get rid of the population. Technology has taken over two things. It's taken over people's critical thinking as well as their life. And it's destroying it. You've talked about that tonight. It's destroying it. I know a man that was from up around Nashville that was friends of my mom's came down. And he had part of his hair on the right side of his head was gone, and he had a scar. And I wondered what had happened to him. He had a brain tumor for spending too much time on cell phones. And he had to have that tumor removed. And when he had it removed, of course, naturally, 
had lost his hair and it never grew back. So what have we gained considering what we are losing? Why don't we go back to using the telephone, regular house phone, or why don't we tree knock? Or better yet, why don't we send kids to spread messages? I don't know how many of y'all ever did this, but if my mama didn't call, she'd say, you run down to so-and-so's house and tell them so-and-so and so-and-so. Bring me the answer back. Kids did that. So, what's going on? That's just my two okay. cents worth. That's good. And you actually echo some of the conversation from yesterday. And, you know, when you think back, before we go on to this bottom line here, where the rubber meets the road thing, let's let's just explore this from a sociological perspective a little, for a minute. And we talked about this yesterday. How many of us, when we were young gave a rat's ass about health and safety none of us <laughs> none of us right <laughs> climb the tree and just you know think well if you fall out you're gonna break your arm mama's gonna get us to the doctor i mean we never were said you can't climb that tree you can't ride that bicycle without a helmet you can't do this you can't do that you know how many got out and let, let me tell you something my sister had a wart come up on her knee my oldest sister and we went to the doctor, and he said, oh, we're going to put medicine on it to get rid of it. Well, it was one of those seed warts that kind of spread, and it was really nasty looking on her knee. I mean, it just really was. And we were out in front of the house one time, and we were playing, I think we were playing kickball or something. And she kicked that ball and ran, and when she fell, she hit that gravel top. Well, it was a, it was a, a paved top, but you know, it had gravel in it. She slid across that. She never had to go back to get the warts removed. It took the top layer of skin off along with the warts. So that kind of saved Mama some money, even though she had a bummed up knee. But we did, our parents didn't worry about us, and we drank water from the garden hose. Crazy things. Rode bicycles all over the neighborhood. Yeah, you know, people have become so, I don't know. I really don't know. I think we've given kids a complex. They're not complex enough to for them to give a crap about irradiating their brains 24-7. That's exactly right. Um, I don't know. But at any rate, my contention is I know government's a problem in and of itself. And I think we see indications of why when we see the, the undue influence and in special interest groups. And it goes really, really a lot deeper than that, but that's for another day. But at any rate, if we are going to delude ourselves with this concept of government, then one must, I guess, hold their feet to the fire because the purpose of government, they occupy a position of trust, both in the colloquial and the legal sense. They occupy a position of trust, which means that these governmental entities that we put in place are placed there to ensure our health and our welfare is looked out for. Right, Gigi Spoo? Yep, that's right. And so with that in mind, in, in the Pollyanna type of world that I'm spinning for you here, by letter of the law, this is their obligation and duty. There is a duty to provide for the welfare, and that's every elected official. Your county board of supervisors, your city council people, that's their obligation. So if they fail in this obligation, is there a recourse? I think there is. Unfortunately, though, that is a reactive recourse, not a proactive recourse. <clears throat> and that's kind of the quandary we find ourselves in, especially since, I just made this discovery, that on February 17, 2000, the United States Court of Appeals and the Second Circuit held that holding a federal telecommunications law preempting states' ability to regulate the health and safety issues with respect to certain personal wireless service facilities does not violate the Tenth Amendment because the statute does not commandeer local authorities to administer a federal program. Cellular Phone Task Force versus the FCC. Interesting case to read. <clears throat> I know it's get some legal, legal beagles crap. I'll try to make some sense out of it here. The petitioners 
all the various petitioners involved here, joined by numerous others and appeal from two final opinions and orders in which the Federal Communications Commission promulgated guidelines for the health and safety standards, health and safety standards of radio frequency radiation, so forth and so on. And those petitions were refused. They were defeated. And it's very detailed, as these cases are, it's very detailed. And they've addressed this from an administrative point of view, the administrative procedures they've looked at from the, the NEPA aspect. And bottom line is that the court held, this court held, that the FCC is superior in deciding the health and safety standards. Kind of an interesting case, and it's one that one will have to consider and try to craft an approach that avoids some of the pitfalls that were discovered in this case. For example, they, the court rejected the petitioner's argument that by not considering RF interference with medical devices, the FCC failed to take the required hard look at the environmental consequences in violation of NEPA. So that didn't fly. The FCC's preemption of certain state regulations, among other things, Congress passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and provided that no state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with commission's regulations concerning such emissions. There again, saying the FCC is the final arbiter in determining the health and safety issues. They also attacked it on constitutional on a constitutional basis by saying that 47 U.S.C. 332 was violated and so forth. That's you know, and we've talked about your rights under Title 47. So the conclusion, and this is a shot across the bow for anyone considering the actions that need to be taken here. The FCC orders are affirmed with costs to be borne by the petitioners. So in other words. If you're the petitioner, you are now have to pay all the court costs associated with this attempt. That sounds like a roadblock, doesn't it? Well, not necessarily. And I have to admit, I have to dig into this a little more deeply. I think there might be some angles to take that avoid some of these pitfalls that are pointed out here in this case, in this determination. One analysis of this case I was looking at suggested that people should craft their attacks in in the form of torts, tort remedies. And a tort is like basically a civil action to do pretty much the same things that laws do. The The government enforces the laws. You as an individual can enforce certain things through the process called a tort, a civil suit of sort. The problem I have with that, by and large, is that that's a reactive action. That's after the fact kind of thing. I think we talked about earlier about how, you know, if the damages start to become widespread and too expensive for the industry to handle, especially since the insurance companies won't cover it, then it'll be turned over to an EMF court, like we have a vaccine court, and the taxpayers will pay all this. And then your tort remedies are out the window because just like in your vaccine court, the companies are held harmless from any legal actions from civil suits and so forth because there is a remedy in place, and that's the your governmental damage courts, whatever you want to call them. Well, right. you know Go what ahead. I find so amusing? They will sell the vaccine, but yet they will not furnish the medication or the drugs. Let's don't call it medication. Let's call it drugs for lethal injection. Can you believe that? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, that, that's that's kind of an interesting concept there. I guess what I'm getting at here is this, this is where the rubber's going to meet the road, is how to maneuver through this minefield that has already been set up back in 2000. And this is where, of course, the industry is going to attempt to have any action summarily dismissed because of this precedence right here but like i say it's something that has to be studied a little more closely second circuit i think in new york area something like that and obviously it's not a supreme court issue so the upside of this is that if approached in a different district with and if the different district had a different outcome that surrounds essentially the same facts 
and now you're setting up a case that goes to the Supreme Court. That's one way to look at it. So it's one upside here. But the other upside is trying to craft yourself around what they did here, the avoidance technique sort of things. That's, and I think that there's evidence, you know, for example, you can bring into question whether the FCC is doing their jobs. Have they included all these recent studies that are coming out and so forth? You know, it's it's very complicated, and for one to take it on individually will be challenging. So it might be something that has to be a group effort of sorts. I'm certainly not going to suggest running out and grabbing your nearest bar member because I think we all know that they sometimes don't operate in your best interest. They may be influenced by other factors. Don't know. This really kind of set a, a big red flag up with me. The other, the other big red flag is something to be concerned about is something that's called like malicious prosecution or something. That's not the right word. I can't think of the word right now. But if you bring an action against someone that is without merit, so to speak, then you could be actually sued over it. And so since this case is in apparently in force, it's something you have to be very careful about before you start moving forward with it. But I think continuing to do the things with giving your testimony in front of, of board hearings and citing the the studies and all you know your objections and so forth is still the way to go and see how that works out but when it comes down to it if it turns into a, a judicial action this these are considerations that are going to have to be looked at anyway don't mean to be a debbie downer on all this but certainly a big concern Gigi's boo what any thoughts i think we're living in a real messed up world i'd like to see go back to a more simpler, easier time. I think you and I have talked about this so many times. It's unreal. And Gary will tell you he thinks that I was born really late, that I should have been born a long time ago because I have a tendency to like the quieter type of life. The work was harder, but still it was quieter. You did your own thing. You were with your family. Families took care of each other. That's not often that we see that anymore. Two paychecks coming into a house, and it's it's really sad because mothers are not home to take care of their children. Fathers, if they're home, they've always got something else to do. Nobody sits down to a meal together anymore. Very sad to me. I would like to go back to a quieter time. I'm a little nostalgic, so I'll push there. That's all right, Jesus Blue, and I guess there's one thing to take away in general from all this is, you know, we've been challenged before as a creation. We've been challenged before many times, in my opinion, over the three billion plus years that Earth has existed. I think we've been challenged many times by many things, and we have persevered. We have come out on the other side, maybe a little beat up, but hopefully a little bit smarter. That's right. And so as we look at all this, keep the faith, baby. <laughs> it, it will turn out okay. Yeah. It will turn out okay. Now, it doesn't mean it's not going to be some people beat up, some losses, some damages. It's all part of the realities of, of where we are. Yeah, I want to say one thing. Um, Beetle in the chat room said, can you hear something when it's absolutely quiet? Yes, you can. If you listen, you can hear that's a whole nother story we'll talk about. But yes, you can hear something when it's absolutely quiet if you listen. So with that I'm gonna say good night. I love y'all big to my heart and remember to take the road less travel. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, and as I hit the wrong button, <laughs> it's that time again. Time for us to say good night and thanks, Gigi's Woo. Thanks for the listeners. And yeah, this was a little bit scattered, a little bit, uh, some concerns out, laid out, but be positive. You know, check this thing out, and we'll look at this more as we travel down the road less traveled. We'll see you next week, hopefully. Take care. Be good. We'll see you.